I would like to begin by saying thank you. Thank you to your pastor and your leadership team for giving me this opportunity to proclaim God's word to God's people today. And I, of course, do not come to you in my own name. But in the name of the living God, and alive and well he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're like me, you don't mind hearing an occasional feel-good story. The one that comes to my mind happened a few years ago. Maybe you've seen it on a YouTube video or ESPN. It was a girls' softball tournament, championship game. And a young lady appears to have hit the winning home run. She's rounding first base, begins to limp, and down on the ground she crashed with a torn ACL in her knee. And there she lay between first and second. The rules state that she herself must touch each base for the run to count and that her teammates may not help her. The opposing players huddled and made a decision. They went to her side, picked her up off of the ground, they carried her to second base, which she touched, and then to third, and then to home plate. The run counted, but those who helped lost the game. But they helped the hurting, and that always feels good. If I might share with you a little bit about the ministry I'm connected to, Wisconsin Lutheran Child and Family Service Christian Family Solutions, highlighted for you in the handout you received this morning as you entered church. For 51 years, this ministry has existed for no other reason than to help the hurting. And the main way that we do that is through our professional Christian counseling. We have about 70 counselors now, five of them are doctors, the rest master's level clinicians operating out of any one of our 42 clinics, mainly in the Midwest. But we don't only serve people that are hurting in the Midwest. If these counselors, these Christian counselors are not seeing somebody who drives to the clinic for the help they need, they're in front of their computer seeing somebody somewhere in the world face-to-face, -face, using technology similar to Skype or FaceTime. Currently, over 500 Wells churches, high schools, world missions, Friends of China, you name it, receive help from us for the hurting among them who need counseling. And my guess is that you know somebody who has either received counseling or should. The number of people who need help is not getting fewer. You name it and we see it. Anything from anxiety to depression, marital problems, problems with children, problems with parents, problems with loss, grief, loneliness, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, internet pornography addiction, and the list goes on and on and on hurting people in need of help, and we're happy to do it. We thank God for the opportunity to help turn lives around, and I appreciate your interest in this ministry. But we don't only help the hurting through a ministry that might have expertise that we ourselves do not possess. Helping the hurting is what you and I do as God's people. I'm going to talk this morning about the classic parable of the Good Samaritan. We probably all here know it pretty well. It should leave no doubt in your mind or in my mind as to what Jesus is looking for in our lives as we live it out until he takes us home to heaven. He wants us not only to notice the hurting, to feel bad about those who are hurting, but to do that which is in our power to help them in their situation. And this parable is not merely a feel-good story. It's not just a how-to 
story. We're going to be reminded this morning that God himself gives to you and to me both the desire and the power to help hurting people because he has made us a part of the best feel-good story there ever will be. My guess is that you know this parable quite well. Jesus is teaching, there's a crowd of people, and suddenly an expert in the law stands up and he tries to trip Jesus up. What's an expert in the law? It's somebody who knew the Bible pretty well. Try to picture it. Jesus is talking, this guy stands up, <clears throat> probably clears his throat. I think he's kind of full of himself, really. And he gets people's attention and uh, he says to Jesus, Tell me, teacher, what do I have to do to get to heaven? <laughs> and Jesus kind of turns it right back on the guy and basically says, well, you're the expert. You tell me. What does the Bible say? And the guy rattles off the passage quite well. He says, well, the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The response that Jesus gave to that sounds like false doctrine. But of course it's not. He basically says to him, buddy, <clears throat> you do that and you're in. What Jesus is getting at is that if this guy could love God perfectly and love his neighbor perfectly, then he would not be among the imperfect who are in need of a savior. He'll be able to get to heaven with his own effort. But of course, that's not possible because this expert was a sinner like everybody else and he needed to learn that. He had the mistaken impression that getting to heaven was sort, was sort of like climbing a ladder. One wrong is the good stuff you try to do. The next wrong is the bad stuff you try to avoid. Keep on climbing. And he figured that when he got to the top rung of the ladder, that's the day he died. He'd find himself in front of heaven's door. The door would swing open and in he would go. It's not how it works. <clears throat> he must have started to doubt his own theory. Because he comes back at Jesus and he says to him, "Ah, uh, yeah, but tell me, uh, who's really my neighbor anyway? My guess is that he had a very tight circle of friends. <clears throat> he had decided that the people inside that circle were his neighbors. Who's inside of his little circle? <clears throat> people that looked like him, acted like him, were educated like he was, was as affluent as he was. He had decided, those are my neighbors, and if they're hurting, I'll feel an obligation to help them, but people outside my little circle, I've decided they're not my neighbors. And if they're hurting, tough luck. <clears throat> and so he had something to learn. And so Jesus tells the classic parable. A man's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and suddenly his day goes south. He's jumped by some robbers. They take everything he has and nearly his life and leave him on the side of the road to die. Two guys, one at a time, come by. They notice this poor guy. They probably look him over a little bit. They shake their heads, look really sad, but they tiptoe around him and go on with their day because they have more important things to do. And these guys should have known better. They're the church-going types, a priest and a Levite. And then you have somebody coming by that you'd never expect to stop, and he stops. It's a Samaritan on his donkey. <clears throat> Samaritans and Jews didn't get along back then, but he, he notices this poor guy. He looks him over, and he jumps down. He's got to do something. And he binds up his wounds the best he can. He puts him on his donkey, walks him into town, checks him into the urgent care facility of their day, stays with him through the night. In the morning, he's got to be on his way, so he gives some cash to the innkeeper and says, I'll be back, and if it costs more than this, We'll settle when I get back. End of story. And then Jesus has a question for the expert. Notice he changes the question from who is my neighbor to who is neighborly to the guy who fell among robbers. And the expert responds, well, 
It's the guy who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, yeah. Yeah. Now, you go and do the same thing. And forget about that little circle of yours. As I mentioned before, this guy had the mistaken impression that getting to heaven was like climbing a ladder. There's another way I like to put it. I call it the work resume, the work resume approach to getting into heaven. You, of course, know what a work resume is. You, you put down your name, your contact information, your work history, your, your uh, education, your references. You make it look really nice, and then you're ready to present it to a potential employer. In this guy's case, his work resume was for working his way into God's heaven. <clears throat> and so on his work resume, it would have to be the good stuff I've done. The bad stuff I've avoided. I'm much better than this guy, and this is why. I'm far holier than this gal, and this is why. And he figured that on the day he died, he'd find himself at heaven's door, the door would swing open, and there's God. He'd hand God his work resume, and God would take it and look it over. God doesn't have glasses, though. <clears throat> he'd look it over. Hmm, yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. My goodness. You know, it's about time we get some folks up here like you. It's not how it works, though, is it? For his work resume to earn him a spot in God's heaven, it would have to be flawless, holy, not one screw up. And after all, when you think about it, you know, it's not our heaven. It's God's. And he's entitled to set the bar. And he does. This guy's work resume would not cut it, would it? <clears throat> it might be a good time in the sermon to ask ourselves the question, how does my work resume look today? I mean, if we're really honest... Aren't there days from our past that we, we would just as soon forget? If only we could forget. Days we're not very proud of. Times when we withheld love from somebody. Times when we withheld forgiveness from somebody. Times when we acted as if the world revolved around us. Days when we worried and fretted instead of trusted and prayed. Maybe days when we weren't too excited about coming to God's house. And when we did, maybe we listened rather selectively. Times when we allowed raunchy thoughts to rattle around in our brain, assuming for a moment they're private. <clears throat> Never private to God, of course. And I'm sure that on more than one occasion, you and I have noticed somebody who's really hurting. We felt pretty bad about it. But we tiptoed around them and went on with our day because we had more important things to do. And we're the church going types. Our work resume would not cut it either, would it? But you know, God so loved the world that he actually did something about that. Think about that. A lot of people can merely talk a good game when it comes to love or merely think loving thoughts. Loving activity is a whole other matter. God in his love took action. And the action that he took was the giving of his dearest treasure in the person of his son, who took on human flesh like you and I have, and then as the perfect, innocent, holy son of God, he waded into the sinful, murky swamp of humanity. But he maintained his holiness in the process. And that's of vital importance to you and me. Because God says in his word that when you believe that his son is your savior, get this. He takes the perfect holy work resume of his son in whom he is well pleased and places it right over the top of our unholy, imperfect work resume and then chooses to view us through the filter of his son's righteousness and that allows his face to shine down upon us with love and approval 
acceptance, and even admiration. That's a God you and I don't have to be afraid of today, tomorrow, or on the day we die. Talk about a feel-good story, and you and I are connected to it. And that's only the half of it. Not only did God's Son live a life of perfection on our behalf, he then eagerly and willingly went to the cross and suffered all the blame and shame for everybody's last sin. In the process, winning for you and for me the forgiveness of all of our sins. So that as far as the east is from the west, and that's a very long distance, that's as far as God has removed our transgressions from us. And God promises in his word that when you believe that his son has done that for you, get this. He chooses to elevate you and me to the status of one of his family. You and I are children of the Most High God. And in that status, we have God's assurance of his presence, his protection, his grace, 24-7, good days and bad days, until finally he takes us to a real, endless, perfect, joy-filled, custom-made heaven. And he'll have his family back together again. Talk about a feel-good story. And you and I, we're connected to it. When you think about everything that God has done, his sacrifice, his patience, his provision, the risks that he takes on our behalf, can you really blame God when in his word he says he has a white, hot anger toward people who merely blow him off. But you and I do not have to fear or dread that. Because when you read your Bible, and I trust you do, it is jam-packed full of expressions that God uses to try to convince you and me that he's serious about us being a part of his feel-good story. He says things like this. I have written your name in the book of life. Think about that. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He cares about the small stuff, too. He says, I have the number of hairs on your head numbered to a hair. And one of my favorites is this. I have tattooed your name on the palm of my hand. What more does he have to say to convince us he is serious about us being a part of his feel-good story? Folks, we are a rags to riches story. We are a sinner to saint story. We are an earth to eternity story. Everything that matters, everything that lasts has been given to you and me. Heaven is not a matter of human effort. It's a matter of divine achievement. And it has been achieved on our behalf. Feel good? Yeah. Yeah. We're not in heaven yet, though, are we? We have chapters in our story yet to be written. And the parable of the Good Samaritan reminds us of what Jesus is looking for in those chapters. And my guess is that everybody here in church today knows somebody who is hurting. When I compare this expert in the law with the guy in the story who's dying on the road, I choose to believe that the expert is actually in worse shape because he's really still dead in his transgressions and, and in his sins. He's spiritually hard up. The light of faith, click, click, had not come on for him yet to the point where he saw a need for a savior and the fact that his savior was the guy he was currently trying to trip up. He was hurting spiritually and didn't realize yet how badly he needed help and that help was available. Which leads me to one last little story I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> In one of the churches that I served as pastor, there was, there was a young lady, probably at the time in her mid-30s, so faithful, Worship, Bible class, service, you name it, a real joy. 
But something about that made her really sad. Her husband, and I'm going to give to him the name Dennis for this story's sake, would not come with her to church. He was a devout atheist. And uh, she talked to me on a number of occasions about her concern for Dennis. He traveled a lot in his work, and she knew if something happened to him, (laughs) he'd be lost eternally. On a couple of occasions when I visited them at their house, he nearly laughed me out of the house. Yeah. After a couple of years, Dennis began to show up in church with her, but he made it obvious to everybody that he was not a willing participant. He did not act appropriately. He was not nice. He was rather rude. But he was there. After a couple of months, Dennis showed up at my office unannounced, and after some small talk, he got to his point. He said to me, Pastor Maddox, that that thing you hand out at church, I don't even know what it's called anyway, a bulletin? He said, yeah, that works. Well, it, it says in there that you've got some kind of a information class starting up. Yeah, Bible information class. Yeah, I might want to take that in, I guess. Whoa, okay. He was a busy guy, and uh, he, his schedule was not compatible with the day and time of the class. So I took Dennis to the class one-on-one. <clears throat> this was a, a 20-week class, a good hour every week, taking a look at what God had to say about everything. And after 20 weeks, I asked him, What do you think, Dennis? I don't know. Could I take the class again? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We we started all over again from the beginning. 20 more weeks. Going on a year. And after we were done the second time around, I asked him again, Dennis, what do you think? And I'll never forget his answer. He said this. I'm just glad I did not die. Click, click. The light of faith had come on. He now knew he needed a Savior and had one in God's Son. I pursued it further with him. I said to him, you know, in 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 the class, Dennis, we talked about the power of the Word of God. And how the Holy Spirit uses the word to to give a person faith and then to sustain that faith. I said, but in in your case, and tell me if I'm wrong, it seems like something else happened before. It helped you to turn the corner to come and hear the word of God in the first place. Am I right? And if so, what was it? He thought for a while. and Yeah, yeah, you're right. What was it? The crazy members of your church. Would you please explain what you mean by that, Dennis? They were crazy nice. And I didn't get it. He went on to explain. He said, remember what a jerk I was when I first came to church? I wanted to say, yeah, I do. But I didn't. He said, that's not how they treated me, though. They they seemed sincerely happy to see me. They tried to help. They broke away from their friends in order to talk to me. They welcomed me to come back. Some guys even asked me to go golfing with them. (laughs) What was that all about? They were crazy nice. And I didn't get it. But now I do. You see, Dennis was an expert vice president of an international corporation. Very smart guy. But he was hurting and didn't even realize how much help he was desperately in need of in his life because he didn't have Jesus yet. My guess is that everybody here this morning knows somebody who's sort of like a dentist. Maybe an expert in this or that. 
have their life together to a certain degree. They're doing okay. But without Jesus, they are in desperate need of help. They're going places. It's just not heaven. Is that person in your life, your opportunity to build a bridge of kindness and helpfulness toward that person so that in God's good time, that person might just notice it, turn around and walk back toward you over the bridge of kindness and helpfulness that you built in order to find out what makes you the way you are. You and I are part of the best feel-good story there ever will be. There are chapters in our story yet to be written. May those chapters include examples of us, us, being good Samaritans, helping the hurting. Amen. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock with Bible study and Sunday school at 1030 or find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net.